connections between family, nature, and community. His last book, which you probably all are familiar with, Last Child in the Woods, has been translated into 10 languages and published in 15 countries. He is particularly proud of being the founding chairman of the Children and Nature Network and also was awarded the National Audubon Medal in 2008. Uh, thank you so much, Richard, for being part of Portland tonight, for being here in Portland and speaking to us and sharing your insights, enthusiasm, optimism, and hopefulness. <laughs> said I could have accomplished that in a magazine article. I didn't agree with that. Um, but I kind of think the nature principle could have been summed up in uh, uh, two words, which is Portland, Oregon. Uh, <laughs> when I was a columnist, I was a columnist in the San Diego Union Tribune for 24 years, and I often wrote about Portland as an example of what San Diego should be doing in terms of land use, et cetera. I, I did that so often that I got quite a few emails and letters saying, well, then why don't you move to Portland? <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't do PowerPoint. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. I did PowerPoint once, actually twice. Once I was required to do it, this uh, it's about six months ago because I'm, I, I basically was brought in as a consultant on, in Minnesota on a, uh, uh, a children's center for mental health. It, it's going to be rebuilt in a new building and they asked me to come in to really make it the first mental health center for children that is nature center. And so they, they said, but you got to do a PowerPoint. <laughs> Jane, you're crazy. Um, so, um, I did it, and I thought I was pretty good. I made all the mistakes, too much information, et cetera, et cetera. And then I thought I'd done pretty well, so I tried it again with another group, and I was, you know, I was headed on behind me, and I'm out here, and I'm, I'm talking, and, and behind me is the, the PowerPoint, and I'm noticing people are looking at it really piercingly. <laughs> and I said, well, I must have done a really good PowerPoint, because they're really paying attention. Then I happened to turn around after a while, and realized that my screensaver had gone on. And it was pictures of my wife and I on a beach. <laughs> she looked great. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me start. I'm going to blame this on Gary Falker. I've done this a couple of times. Gary in the audience. Uh, met him quite a while ago. Uh, I had several friends in the, in the audience. Uh, one friend isn't here, it's Mike uh, Houck, who I've had a few beers with, and uh, a great guy. I write about him quite a bit in The Nature Festival. In any case, <clears throat> this is a, a um, this is a um, chapter called The Garden. <clears throat> and I, it was originally going to be uh, the introduction, but I thought it was a little too dark. So I, uh, I put it deeper into the book. It begins a section um, called Vitamin M, which is about health. And uh, the name of this short piece is The Garden. Memories are seeds. When I was a boy, the good times in my family were more often than not, associated with nature, with fishing trips, discovered snakes, and captured frogs, with dark water touched by stars. We lived at the edge of the suburbs in Raytown, Missouri. At the end of our backyard, cornfields began, and then came the woods, <clears throat> and then more farms that seemed to go on forever. Every summer, I ran through the fields with my colleague elbowing forest of whipping stalks and leaves to dig my underground forts and climb into the arms of an oak that had outlived Jesse James. When the corn harvest was over, my father and I would walk through the stubble 
and search uh, for the ground nests and speckled eggs of killdeer. Together we watched with admiration as the parents attempted with tragic cries and faked broken wings to lead us away from their nest. I recall my father's dark tan neck, creased with lines of dust as he tilled our garden. I ran ahead of him, pulling rocks and bones and toys from his path. My father, mother, little brother, and I planted strawberry starts and buried, buried seeds for butternut squash in our own sweet corn. One year, my father read about the productivity of Swiss chard, and as was his, as was his way, became fully committed. That summer, we bagged Swiss chard for weeks. Our kitchen and part of our basement overflowed with it. My mother canned it. I carried brown shopping bags full of Swiss chard to the neighbors. My mother loved to tell the story about the summer the Swiss chard ate the neighborhood. <laughs> Controlled by no community associations, our yard was humbled by locusts and heat and other natural covenants. With all my senses, I recall a late afternoon when my father and mother and my brother and I raced the weather to complete the construction of a retaining wall, facade, and garden. We placed limestone slabs into a line to hold back erosion. We felt the wind quicken and the air change and stood up together near the end. We wiped sweat from our foreheads and stood and stared at the quilted pea green sky, felt a queasy stillness and sudden burst of wind, and then we saw the hail advancing yard to yard like an invading army. We rushed to the basement door. Such moments became part of the family lore because our time in the garden and on the water and in the woods held our family together. After a while, my father, who worked as a chemical engineer, earned more money and ventured out of the house less. The garden faded, replaced by Kentucky bluegrass, bluegrass sod. Neighbors erected chain-link fences. Our collie no longer ran free, and neither did we. Instead of Swiss chard and uneven bumps of earth for pumpkins and squash, the yard became ordered and lined with evenly spaced shrubs. Instead of planting vegetables, we pulled dandelions, eliminated the variances, enforced order. The summer sun came to feel oppressive. My mother told the story of the Swiss chard on fewer occasions, and then not at all. The garden became a dim memory. We moved to a larger house. While I was away at college, the job market for chemical in engineers dried up. My father had always dreamt of retirement, of moving to the Ozarks. He believed that once there, he would fish all day and plant a large garden. So he and my mother and brother moved to the mountains of southern Missouri to Table Rock Lake. By then, however, my father was spending most of his hours at the kitchen table staring. He caught few fish. He planted no garden. He and my mother moved back to the suburbs. A dozen years later, as I sat in the desk chair where he had taken his own life, I opened a drawer. <clears throat> there I found a handwritten document titled Accounts Due. It was a bitter ledger of his days, a reduction of our family into numbers. But tucked into those paragraphs was a sentence that mentioned a good period of his life, what he called his one brief Eden. I looked at the sentence for a while. I knew when that was. I am now older than my father was when he died. My life in writing had been changed and shaped by that time at the edge of the cornfield. Sometimes it seems to me that what happened to my father, the disappearance of nature in his life, and his descent into illness, parallels the life of our culture. As children's freedom to roam has diminished, as families have pulled inward, as nature has become an abstraction. I understand that this equation is incomplete. Which came first, the illness or the withdrawal from nature? I honestly don't know the answer to that question. But I often wonder what my father's life would have been like if the vernacular of mental health therapy had extended beyond Thorazine and Quaaludes and into the realm of nature therapy. 
As a boy, I must have sensed nature's power to heal. As I watched my father withdraw, I wished that he would quit his job as an engineer, become a forest ranger. <laughs> Somehow I believed that if he were to do that, then he would be all right, and we would be all right. I realize now, of course, that nature alone would not have cured him, but I have no doubt it would have helped. Perhaps these childhood experiences are why, as an adult, I am compelled to believe in the restorative power of nature, in a human nature reunion, and that because of this nature, and because of this reunion, life will be, life will be better.